Hello, welcome to How to Write a Novel. So uh, I wanted to talk a bit today about this quote. I actually got a bunch of books from, I went to like the thrift stores around Vancouver and I just, uh, just as something weird to do, I just bought, well, I saw like a couple of books. I try not to have too many books because I travel a lot and I got to fit them all in a book bag. So I try not to have too many books on me. Like I've got this one book that uh, I'm going to talk about soon because I'm almost done reading it but it's like a giant collection of four Octavia Butler books that I've read before but I'm like hey here's a good uh, excuse to read them all again but it's an enormous book and I've literally taken it around the world with me you know so I'm like I gotta finish this fucking book before I get on another flight so I didn't want to have too many physical books because you know the difference between having one book bag and two book bags is enormous. It's incredible how much more difficult traveling is with two pieces of luggage. But I found too many books that I wanted to read. I found like three or four, particularly in the nonfiction section. If you just go like, go check out like the weird self-help shelf section in a thrift store, there's just interesting stuff. That I'm just like, you know, I just kind of wanted, this seems interesting. Let's check this out. So I decided to go the other way. Instead of resisting, I was like, you know what? Fuck it. Let's just get every book that's interesting to me and then try to burn through them as fast as I can. They're just thrift store books anyway. Just read them like a fucking asshole. Just like really do a shit job burning through these books. And it was kind of a, a fun little experiment that, yeah, I'll do a podcast about what I learned from skimming all these books. I jotted down whenever there was a quote that kind of stood out as something interesting. But today I just want to talk about one. It's this book called Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind by Shunryu Suzuki that I actually, I kind of bounced off. I didn't read very much of this book. I found it a little tough to digest. But one thing the guy said that did stand out to me is to give your sheep or cow a large, spacious meadow is the way to control him. That quote really stood out to me because it's such a, an awesome quote. It's totally true. It's like, if you want to control something, don't make it seem like it's being controlled. You put a cow in a big field, it's not leaving that field. You've got it. It's contained. But as far as it knows, it's a pretty big field. It can wander around every day. It never feels trapped, so it never tries to escape. It doesn't rebel. And that's like a perfect metaphor for this style of writing that I have been talking about the whole time in this podcast. The idea of making sure that you write every day, but not pushing yourself too hard on any specific day. Don't punish yourself because you didn't write enough on a given day. Basically, I'm doing that to myself. I've given myself a nice big field. It's like, hey, you've got all day. You've got all day and you just have to write something. I don't care if it's one sentence. I don't care if it's half a sentence, just something. And you got all day to do it. It's not asking that much. It's not that big a deal. I don't feel trapped. I don't feel like I'm contained. I don't feel like, like my creative mind is being shepherded. But on a longer timeline and a larger scale, I have absolutely locked myself down. Like, my little creative mind, my little creative writer side of myself is completely under my control and under my, like, imprisonment from now till the end of time. Every single day, I'm going to make that thing work. Every single day, I'm going to make that thing right. But the reason this is working out and the reason my creative mind isn't rebelling is because it doesn't feel like I'm pushing. It doesn't feel like too much. It's just that nice big field. It's like, don't worry, you got all day. Just do a little bit of work. Just here's your big field. Just graze a little bit. Don't worry about it. And it's interesting being, you know, the taskmaster and the worker, you know, being both sides. It's interesting to like, deconstruct yourself this way to be this aware of the situation but it still works you know it doesn't make it not work 
it's okay to be aware of what's going on and it, it still works. My uh, creative side, my little writer side, it's going to be worked to the fucking bone for the rest of my life, every single day. But it's going to seem all right because it's a comfortable imprisonment. It's a nice big field. And it really does work. Like, ever since I got back from Japan, I've kind of been off the wagon. I mean, I just have been so unproductive with writing. I just, I don't know that I've had a single really productive day since I got back. Everything just feels kind of discombobulated and weird and like, I don't know, I just can't seem to, like every single day is like a, a quote unquote failure. Like every single day I just squeeze out a tiny little bit of writing. Like I said, uh, I guess it was two episodes back, you know, I was particularly stuck, so that's one reason. It was a really tough chapter that I'm still slogging through. But even beyond that, it's just like this idea that I only have to do a tiny little bit every day, that if I write a sentence or two every day, that's fine. I'm really putting that to the test here. It's like, that literally is it. That's all that's been happening. Every day I get a sentence or two, and I just feel like I'm lifting a thousand pound stone. <laughs> it's like hard to do. I put it off all day, and then finally at some point I do a little bit of work, and then I just am like, oh, I did it. Okay, that's fine. I did it for today. That's, that's enough. Let's just move on. <laughs> and that just keeps happening over and over and over. Like, I'm kind of at like the lowest ebb I could be at as far as like working every day. I still am working every day, but it's just, it's the bare minimum. It's so little that's getting done. It's going so slow. Things are going so shitty. But that's the great thing about this method. That's the great thing about this technique is that's fine. You know, I'm still getting work done. I'm still moving forward. I'm still progressing. Basically, in the unlikely event that this just continues forever, say I just continue to suck this much for the rest of my life. Every day, it's like literally a sentence or two. It's just the worst. It's just going so slow and so bad. That's fine. I'll still finish some books. I'll still get things done. It still adds up. A little bit is still valuable. It's it's fine. Nothing is the only problem. Getting nothing done is nothing, you know? Anything more than nothing eventually adds up. And it's just such a, a neat way to read that little quote and to think of it that way. It's like, yeah, like, I'm just fucking... It's all in the perspective, you know? In the perspective of the cow who's in the big field, everything's fine. He doesn't even know that he's penned in. But from the larger perspective, he's trapped in that field forever. And in the writing sense, it's like, man, this is just sucking over and over. This little tiny bit of work I'm doing is like nothing. It seems so valueless. It seems so small. I'm just this tiny little bit every day. From the, you know, the daily writer perspective, the down on the ground perspective, it seems like, oh man, I'm just, I'm hardly offering anything. What am I even giving? This tiny little bit of work every day? It's like, it's nothing. It doesn't feel like it's a big stressor on me because I'm giving so little each day. It's like, I'm offering so little writing. I'm doing so little. But the fact that it feels like so little is what keeps me, keeps me here, keeps me in the game, keeps me involved. Where like from the bigger perspective, if I zoom out, I'm still writing a book. It's fine. Nothing has, is wrong <laughs> from the larger perspective. It's like, it doesn't matter that I'm quote unquote failing every day because I'm I'm still doing the little bit of work. That little writer side of me, that little creative side of me, he's still, he's still in the shackles. He's still doing the work every day, and he's going to do the work every day till I fucking die. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know that I'm explaining this that well. But it's just like... I guess, I mean, that's what I like so much about this little habit I've established, is like that I, I'm not reliant on the big burst of work. I'm not reliant on the big batch of fucking productivity or inspiration. It's just the little grind. And it would be nice if I can get the daily grind a little bit back on track, get my shit together, get a little more done each day would be nice. But I can't fail. I can't fully fall off because I'm I've trapped my little writer self in a nice big field, a nice comfortable place where he's got all day to just do something. 
and it's comfortable enough and it's easy enough that the chain doesn't break, the routine doesn't stop, the gears don't stop grinding, even when shit is just fucking not really going that well, it's still going, you know? When I look back at uh, what I've written since I got back from Japan, it's not a ton, but it's more than I had before, and every single day it's a little more and a little more and a little more. And what's nice is, so... So that's basically my existing projects are going especially slow, particularly the novel. Because as I've said, like I've kind of built up my little daily portfolio. Like I work on this little text game that I'm making. I work on kind of a backup novella that I'm working on. I come up with one random idea per day minimum. Just make sure I come up with some idea for a future story. And then the main one is the novel. So all of those things always were just small, just tiny little drips of work except the novel. The novel was the thing that like, hey, let's really, let's try to focus on this. Let's try to give a shit. So the novel has slipped down to the same level as all those other things, you know? Like I'll write like one line of dialogue for my little text game. I'll write a sentence or two for my little novella. I'll write down some little idea for, you know, some other story that's in the works. That has always been the case with those. They have always been just a teeny tiny drip of work every day. That's how I've kind of expanded how much stuff I work on each day. So basically the novel has just fallen down to those levels. The novel is just another one of those things that I just do the little bit, just the little sentence or two. And I would like to get to a place where I'm kind of fucking getting a little more done, but it's okay. It's just how things are right now. I'm just discombobulated in my brain. I've come back to Canada. I didn't necessarily want to. It's like my mind is kind of still in Japan. I'm like always thinking like, when should I go back? You know, how can I work that out? But for now I'm here and I'm going back to Toronto and then I'm going back to my hometown for Christmas. It'll be a little while before. Got to see if my friend Brad stays in Japan. That would help if he was still there. My mind is elsewhere, you know? I'm just not focused on this thing. And that's fine, you know? Like, things will be fine, like... Because I've also noticed that. I know I uh, talked about that once in this podcast where I really fell off. I fell off for like two whole weeks. I just stopped working on this book because I was... My sleep schedule was all fucked up. It was super hot. I was just out of my mind. And like, my natural rhythms and inclinations were just telling me. My natural sense in my body was just like, we just need to stop for a little bit. We got to take a break. This is going nowhere. So maybe that's all this is too. Maybe just these natural rhythms of my brain. I mean, it's summer again. Maybe that's not coincidence. It's hot as fuck. I'm sweating through my clothes, you know? It's just like, maybe this is just the wrong time to be working on a fucking book, you know? So I'm just going to let my subconscious, be my subconscious, just let things happen the way they happen. But this time I'm still holding on, you know? I'm getting almost nothing done, but I'm just, that little bit is fine. Just keep things going, just keep the fucking train moving and just things will, things will pick up speed again. Things will just work again, but I can't force myself. I can't like bully myself into working. I can't try to compel myself to work more when I just don't have it in me right now. I've just got to keep that metaphor the way it is. It's like, I got my cow in the big field grazing away and he's just contentedly grazing away. And every day he's still working. He's still working for me. He's still giving me that writing every day. And he doesn't feel trapped and he doesn't feel overwhelmed and he doesn't feel stressed because he doesn't feel like he's trapped. But he is, so don't worry. He's not going anywhere. (laughs) I got him. I got him locked down. So if he's just wants to be extra lazy for a little while, that's fine. Let him. Just don't let him feel contained. Don't let him feel trapped. Don't let him feel like he needs to escape from this situation. Just let him stay right here. Let him stay comfortable. Let things just keep progressing as they are because they are still progressing. I hope that made some kind of sense talking about two sides of myself, all this fucking weird shit. But the other thing I wanted to talk about is, even though things are grinding away very slowly right now, and progress is very slow, and I'm just getting those little bits done every day, I still am keeping up the habit. You know, I'm still writing every day. I'm still, haven't missed a day. I haven't broken the chain. Things are still going. I can't remember the last time I missed a day. I think it's been quite a while. 
And what's nice about this is I've just become so comfortable with writing every day and with the routine that even if it is a very slow routine, that when something new gets introduced in, it goes really easily. So, uh, so me and my friend Ray do this movie podcast called The Prison Wallets that is like, it's getting a little bit popular. It's interesting. You can really tell when a podcast is going somewhere and when it's not. You know, I've been involved in plenty of podcasts where you just know they're going nowhere. No one seems to really care. There's no momentum. This podcast has a little bit, you know, sometimes I get a little message from somebody. I get a little email. I get a little fucking iTunes review. Those little bits, you really can't take them for granted, you know, because any bit of activity, any bit of engagement is again, just like infinitely better than not having it, you know? It's so easy to just be invisible on the internet. It's so easy for nobody to care. So if even only a little bit of people care, that's enormous, that's important, you know? That's something that should be paid attention to. That's something that should be appreciated. And with this Prison Wallets podcast, we're definitely noticing that. Like again, it's very small, very small time podcast, but every once in a while, one of our episodes kind of gets popular on YouTube and gets comments and stuff and our subscribers are slowly creeping up, like real slow, but just, again, like you can just feel it. You can feel when there's momentum. So basically we record like a big batch of shows when I'm in Toronto and uh, we release them throughout the year, which is what we've been doing this time. So I'm about to go back to Toronto and record a big batch of, uh, you know, another season of episodes, another year's worth or whatever of shows that we can just put out throughout the year while I'm gone. So we've been blabbing a bit, you know, talking back and forth, thinking about what we're going to do, setting up stuff. And Ray mentioned this idea he had for a Friday the 13th movie. Like, it'd be so cool if he could write one. And he's like, here's what I would do. Like, it would be wintertime. And Camp Crystal Lake has been kind of renovated. They're like putting up cabins and shit there, but it's winter time. And Jason gets revived from the lake and comes out and it's like a winter time Jason movie. And just from that little spark, that little bit of an idea, you know, we were trying to think of stuff to do podcasts about. And I was like, you know what, why don't we do some podcasts about, let's try to write a horror movie and we'll chronicle it on the podcast. That'd be cool. Just a fun thing to listen to. And if somehow it ever got made someday, similar to this podcast, like a neat thing to listen back to. Like, oh shit, here they are talking about that movie. So he was like, yeah, yeah, let's talk about that when you're in Toronto. But just that little spark got me going. And just like, because my little millstone is grinding away and my gears are turning every day, even though most of my stuff is going at a snail's pace right now, I just slotted this one in. I'm like, well, along with this other stuff that I'm working on, let's just, I almost couldn't help it. I'm like, let's just think about this. What would this be? What would this horror movie be? And I couldn't believe how fast I came up with a ton of stuff, like uh, essentially a fully formed horror movie idea, you know, like the, the details need to be figured out. But I was basically just like, well, what if we just made a Jason movie without Jason, you know, fuck that, like just make our own character. That's easy enough. There's a lot of horror tropes. There's no shame in just kind of retreading the past. That's what everybody does. It's accepted in horror movies. It's a, it's an homage. So what if we had a wintertime lake and some cabins and a horrible monster in the water who comes back to life? What could that be? And to give you the super fast rundown, I was thinking like, well, what do what do we like? What are we into? For whatever reason, Ray really likes clowns. He's got like clown masks in his apartment. We took some photos for the Instagram, for the Prison Wallet's Instagram, and it's like us with these clown masks in front of all his horror memorabilia because he just happens to have clown masks. So I was like, all right, clowns. Say this drowned guy has a clown mask. He's under the water. He's got this creepy clown mask. He gets revived, comes back out of the water, starts killing everybody. He's got the clown mask on. But what if the clown mask you know gets torn off toward the end of the movie what does he look like underneath so i was like all right i got ray covered what he likes what do i like i like the band mr bungle (laughs) their 1995 album disco volante was for years my favorite album and on the cover it's got a, a viper fish which is a terrifying looking fish and just deep sea fish in general are the most horror movie thing that we got and i don't feel like that's been exploited very much in horror movies So I just started looking up creepy undersea fish and particularly the viper fish and they just look scary as shit. So I was like, what if his face, his mask gets torn off and he's got the viper face. He looks like viper face. We can call him viper face. That's that'll be his name. He'll be clown face. And then 
that gets torn off and he's viper face. If they ever make toys, they can make both. You know, fucking statues, action figures, whatever. And I was thinking like, all right, well, why has he got a viper face? Like, what if his origin was he was like in a sideshow and he could be the amazing fish face? Like maybe his face before he died, he just had a weird flat face. He looked like a fish man. So if you just take a crazy viper face and put a human skin, stretch a human face over it, that's just what this guy looked like. He was a weird sideshow freak. And how did he end up in the lake? Like maybe he's a creepy child molester, like fucking Freddy, you know? Let's just steal from everything. Let's just take from all sources. So like Freddy Krueger was a kid diddler <laughs> and the neighborhood trapped him and burned him to death. What if this guy, the, uh, the fish face, the amazing fish face, as they were traveling around in the traveling circus, he gets, uh, they realize he's a kid toucher. He's some awful pedophile. Maybe he kills a kid, I don't know. They're real pissed at him. So they toss him in the fucking lake. And that's how he ends up down there. So our erstwhile teens, because of course we need a bunch of teens to get killed, they could be, like, this property is like, it's a bad property, there's a lot of urban legends about it, people don't like it. So one of the teens is like grandparents own it and are trying to uh, build a bunch of new cabins, make this into a thing. So not all the cabins are done being built yet, it's winter time still, but they have access to this place before it is reopened. They're gonna go do some winter partying, because that's something me and my friends in Toronto always talked about, is uh, one of my friend's parents has like this cool lakeside property we go to sometimes, and we always talked about going in the winter, but we never did. So these kids are like, yeah, let's go, fucking, well, kids, you know, early 20s, whatever. And they're like, let's go, uh, hey, we got access to these, these cabins by this lake, let's go do some winter camping, you know, just hang out inside, we'll play board games and get drunk, basically. Listen to music and drink and it'll be fun. And just because I needed, uh, you know, a bunch of teens that I have no idea who they are or what they're all about or whatever. So I used that same thing I mentioned when I was talking about my sepaternal story where just as a placeholder, I just used the characters from Firefly. <laughs> I'm like, well, let's do that again. That's a good mix because it's five guys and four girls. And I named them after the actors from Firefly for now because who cares? That's fine. They just need names. Like, who cares? They're just the, the, they're just the body count, <laughs> you know? And it sets up good because you can have some couples, you know, maybe one couple that just broke up, but they're still there, you know, hanging out, trying to make it work. You got that fifth guy, the fifth wheel, <laughs> who's just doesn't, isn't with anybody. He's the generic weirdo nerd, either skinny nerd or big fat party animal. There's always got to be one of those. And I was thinking they could sit around and tell urban legends about what they heard about this lake. And I came up with a bunch of those, you know, one of them is the legend of Fish Face and uh, some ideas for how Fish Face could come back to life, why that happened, some weird shit. But basically, Fish Face comes out of the water, clown face at this point, starts killing everybody, you know, generic slasher shit. I got a lot more ideas, but I don't need to get into them all here. We'll do that on the Prison Wallets podcast, but uh, then I was thinking like one of the dudes could when he realizes that they're in a serial killer horrible situation he starts killing people too because he always wanted to he's like a psycho and he's like this is my chance everyone's getting killed i'm gonna join in on the killing and then i just had this little idea of like how can we <laughs> double the body count and it would just be a funny thing is like what if we introduce just to make things kind of crazy put a necronomicon in i just watched the evil dead remake for our prison wallets podcast I'd never seen the remake and it's like pretty cool. And I'm like, what if we do that? Like where it's, it's just crazy, crazy shit happens, but they take it seriously, even though it's ridiculous. So let's just put in a Necronomicon type book. That's one of the urban legends. That's part of the thing. And through it, they could like do different spells. And like, what if the kids could get sort of powers, kind of like Friday the 13th part seven, where there's the clairvoyant uh, woman who's fighting Jason just to really make things wacky. Give people powers and then fucking clown face gets powers too and all this shit. But how I had the original idea is what if a bunch of them had been killed and they realized if they do everything right and get all the special regents and shit and the right pages of the book that they can cast a spell to bring their friends back. And I want the like the second after their friends come back, clown face busts in and kills them all again. <laughs> I just think that would be so funny. But play it serious. Play it like it's a real serious situation, even though it's fucking absurdly stupid. And just came up with all this stuff of like, the different magic and how it works here and there. And this guy fucking fish face to clown face to viper face and he's fucking killing these fucking assholes and all the shit that could happen. And just, I couldn't believe how much stuff I came up with. 
came up with an ending, came up with either calling it Viper Face, or I have another idea for a title, I don't know, but fucking the whole thing, good enough. I've got like a rough idea of how everything's going to go in like three days because I'm just so primed and I'm so used to this writer grind that introducing something new into it, it was like, holy shit, you know? So I just wrote down ideas till they dried up, like for the first like five, six days, just tons of ideas. So I just have a big file full of shit. Then that kind of slowed down. I'm like, okay, this is more than enough for now. You know, I'll pitch this stuff to Ray, see what he thinks. We'll work on it from here. So I just went through those notes. Then I just added them into my daily thing is one of the things I do every day now is go through those Viper face notes and split them up chronologically into like before Viper face rises from the lake while he's still got the clown mask on, and then the end when he's just his crazy scary fish face. And once I've got those all arranged, I'll piece them, you know, put them together into scenes, if there's things that all fit together in scenes, then I'll write out those scenes and just see what I got. And if a movie script is like, I like horror movies especially to stay svelte, so I think like a a 90 minute script, they say is roughly 90 pages, I'm aiming for 80 pages. (laughs) Like, let's keep this thing real fucking lean. And I figure once I write out all the scenes that I've got and all the stuff I've got, I'll probably have about 20, 25, maybe 30 pages. And now I'm just grinding those out. I'm just working on that, just adding it to the grind. And that's just so cool because at the same time that I was like really starting to, to question like, like, man, things are going slow. Is this a problem? What the fuck? This grind is really grinding. It is really grinding slow. But then introducing this new thing in and it just, it just flowed so well and so smooth. And I feel so confident about the process. I'm like, ah, I've got you in the, in the grips now, Viper face. Hey, new horror movie story. Guess what? It may seem like my creative self is just a fucking lazy cow lazing around in his big field, not doing very much every day, but he's trapped and now you're trapped. You're in here, you are in the grind, and now it's just a matter of time before you're finished. I'm just gonna keep grinding and keep grinding until this fucking story is done. And it's just like, yeah. So yeah, that's cool, man. <laughs> I guess that is, that is just all I'm really trying to describe this episode is like those two levels of like, you know, with a microscope where you, you zoom in and then you've got to switch to the other dial to get the fine detail. Like from the one perspective, things aren't going that well. Everything's going very slow. But from the other perspective, everything's still going. And even though it's slow, it is sturdy. It is strong. It is consistent. It is reliable. That cow is trapped forever. You're trapped forever. I got you. After all these years of like trying to tame my creative self and trying to make myself work, I found the solution, and the solution is to give your sheep or cow a large spacious meadow is the way to control him. Thank you, Shunryu Suzuki. Rest in peace. You're a wise man, my friend, even if the rest of your book didn't make a fucking lick of sense to me. That part did. All right, for Song of the Day, I was thinking, too, I love just using... Uh, music in this case is especially great. I'm going to be one of these guys who's going to write specific songs right into my movie script. You know, I, I've heard that that's not, you know, not normally what people do, but some people do, and that's what I'm going to do. And if somebody ever made this movie, they can just, you know, I mean, it's up to them. They can do whatever they want. But I'm going to, I'm going to have what songs I envision for these different scenes. And one of them is when the murders start happening, and they're all trapped in this fucking lakeside place and they can't get out because of the cold and because uh, fish face fucking pulled all the wheels off their cars and they can't get out and they realize they're in a fucking horror movie murder scenario and their friend also realizes that and realizes this is his chance to be a psycho and to start stalking his friends and to join in on the killing the song that i imagine playing while he stalks around and looks for his friends is top of the world by the fuck is her name Kimbra? Something like that? Fuck, I can't remember. And it doesn't seem to be on my phone. I'm on top, I'm on top, I'm on top of the world. That song. Because it's kind of a weird song to play for a stalking around murder horror movie, but that would be part of the deal. 
as I see it, is just slightly off-kilter songs, songs that don't really quite fit in the scenario or in the genre, because I think that is just cool. It's like uh, we did a Prison Wallets It's about the movie Sinister, and man, one of the things about Sinister is the music is so fucking great. It's so weird and just not quite right for a horror movie, which makes it better. So let's listen to that. As usual, uh, same caveat as always. I hope that made some kind of sense. I hope my fucking ramblings make some kind of sense. But hey, if they didn't, man, you've been here for a hundred episodes. What are you doing, man? (laughs) At this point, you know, you're in or you're out. Yeah, here it is. It's on my little, my other little MP3 thing. Top of the World by Kimbra. Fucking sweet. All right, here it is. Talk to you later. Like a minute, feel like a god.